So uh, now our topic is uh, Kodak and the real story of its decline. This is a, a topic that I have a lot of personal passion for because I grew up in Rochester, uh, Kodak's hometown, and both my grandfather and my father uh, were physicists who spent their entire working careers at Kodak. Uh, and I've been very frustrated by the way the story's been told about managerial complacency uh, be, and, and people being asleep at the switch being the root of everything. Uh, it, up until a year ago, the way I fought back against that was just when I was editing McKinsey Quarterly articles and I thought people were misusing it, I would, I would change it. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but then Willie came to the rescue uh, last spring and wrote an article in the Sloan Management uh, Review uh, called The Real Lessons of Kodak's Decline. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, before doing so, I think Willie's going to try to ground us a bit in uh, the Kodak story, just uh, for those of you who can't remember uh, what it was like to go to the drugstore and drop off your film. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Alan. And, and so I thought I would just uh, uh, show some pictures, and this is Kodak's moment, and I use it in the past tense. Uh, you know, Alan and I were talking, I, I would argue that George Eastman was either we were talking about was he the Bill Gates of this time or is he the Steve Jobs of this time because his innovation was really to take something that was very complex, a chemical process, and reduce it to something that was very simple. You push the button, we do the rest. It created a tremendous fortune. There was a time in the late 60s or early 1970s when Kodak had the highest market, market capitalization of any stock of the New York Stock Exchange. Right? Most of us don't remember things like that. I only I learned that in retrospect. One of the things the company did was develop this tremendous scale and scope in terms of being able to manufacture film, which was a, uh, a product that had uh, very high entry barriers. Uh, there's a picture here, which is a 60-inch wide coating machine. Uh, that uh, picture on the right of the wheel, that was uh, a wheel that was used to form acetate. It's about three stories high. It was optically flat. So you can imagine what kind of process uh, that, that made things like that. Okay, so, you know, what you'd do is you would take this acetate film 60 inches wide. You'd coat it with, uh, with 24 layers simultaneously. This is a picture from a recent book uh, of, you know, a veteran of Kodak who wanted to document all the processes. You'd co coat it at 300 feet per minute with 24 layers, controlled thickness, micron levels, and uh, it was really kind of an incredible process. Just before I left Kodak, I took a panoramic picture of Kodak Park, which was the largest industrial park in the United States uh, at the time, three miles long. It's uh, about twice the size of Central Park in Manhattan. Uh, I actually got invited back to Rochester for the first time uh, in 12 years. I was back there this Monday. Uh, all but about three of those buildings are now gone, okay? Uh, but, you know, you saw this tremendous type of scale and scope, both on the film side and also, of course, in the digital imaging side. Uh, I just point out that my proudest moment was, you know, when we actually made column six of the Wall Street Journal in March 2005 when we were number one market share in digital cameras in the U.S. You know, they put us in the... This drove Steve Jobs crazy, of course, okay? But, you know, it's like... Kodak and Apple uh, had, you know, uh, done very well. So, you know, that was just some context, and now I'll give it back to Alan. <laughs> this, uh, yeah, just to, we shouldn't keep this up too long, but uh, this is a family picture in 1980. Uh, this is the 100-year 100 100-year anniversary of Kodak. Their centennial motto was Kodak 1880 to 1980, uh, a 100-year start on tomorrow. Uh, I put this up just, uh, I love my grandparents, but uh, so this is my grandfather who, um, spent his career at Kodak, and it, this is a reminder of what, you know, an amazing group of technical talent this company had. He, my grandfather also was uh, drafted to work on the Manhattan Project during the war, and it, he was not alone. It was an unbelievable string of technical talent. And then my dad on the far left, I'm really sorry, my mom and sister, these pictures are old, but uh, my dad, uh, I remember in the 80s, uh, when he was teaching me about investing around the kitchen table, describing why he diversified out of Kodak stock pretty aggressively, and he talked about digital photography, and he said, someday this will be the end of Kodak. People were not, their heads were not in the sand, and they were, uh, it was quite a, quite a capable bunch. So with that, William, please, let's, let's not spend yeah, too long. We can get it. <laughs> 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 um, so, so what, Willie, does everyone get wrong about the Kodak story? Well, well uh, the thing that I think people uh, do is they oversimplify, and they say, well, 
management did not see it coming, okay? And uh, I, I think that's absolutely incorrect. Uh, going back to the 1980s, it was actually the advent of the Sony Mavica when uh, management first started uh, looking at this digital threat. It's like, uh, of course management saw it coming. It's not like they sat there with their eyes closed uh, for 25 years. Uh, the question, and I think where the learnings come from, is what was it about the nature of the problem, okay, and the strategic choices that they made uh, that led to the result that we saw that was perhaps inevitable, okay? And uh, so uh, I, think <laughs> I, I think that's kind of a vast oversimplification. It's easy to say in hindsight, right? But what that does is obscures the real lessons. So, so let's hear about that. What, what do you think the real story is of so, Kodak's decline? You know, and I've thought about this a lot after leaving Kodak. I left uh, in 2005, so that was quite a while ago, okay? But uh, if you look at that business, uh, in, in the analog business, they had scale economies and entry barriers, okay? So uh, if, uh, if you looked at some of the production technologies where they had to do a lot of very fundamental innovations, uh, there were only maybe two other companies, Fuji and Agfa, who ever were able to uh, overcome some of those barriers and actually provide viable competition, okay? And there was an enormous learning curve that went with the technology, as you can imagine, right? Because in the end, uh, what did it cost to make a roll of film? Uh, well, the joke was it was probably a million dollars for the first roll and a penny for every roll thereafter, which they would sell to you for $4.50, right? And in those days, that came from those types of scale economies. Uh, people joked that, you know, that was better than drugs, right? It really was. The gross margins were enormous. Now, when you went to the digital technology, all of a sudden, it became modular, okay? That means people could buy pieces. And the people who benefited from the scale economies were no longer Kodak. They were the semiconductor guys, okay? So they couldn't benefit from the learning curves, and there were no entry barriers. So that dramatically changed the nature of the competition, uh, which meant it was going to commoditize. We actually... Uh, my team, we ran a war game in, I think it was 2002, where we looked at some of those aspects and we said, you know what, our prediction at that time, the phones were going to kill us. So, um, with the benefit of hindsight, and you got to Kodak in 1998, uh, is there anything you would have done differently? Yeah, now, now this is really hard, okay, because with the benefit of hindsight, I went in uh, actually July 7th, 1997, but who's counting? <laughs> uh, it, it happens that that was also the uh, cover date on Business Week. It had a picture of Lou Platt from HP holding a digital camera about how he was going to come after Kodak. That's why I remember. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, uh, and hindsight's always 2020. It, I understood then what I do now about kind of this modular layer of the nature of the technology and what it meant for commoditization. What I should have done, what I would do now is two things. First, I would recognize that we could play in that digital imaging business for some period of time, okay, but it was inevitable that it was going to commoditize. And I sort of got that sense when I was there too late, okay? But the other thing I would have done is I would have marched in and said, you know, you want us to build, you, want to, you hired me to build a digital camera business. What you really want me to do is take those chemistry and coding skills and take it to other places, okay? Now, why would that have been hard? You know, that, that's more a competing on capabilities question. It would have been very hard because it would have been counterintuitive to walk away from what was then one of the world's great consumer franchises. Okay, so if I actually said that, I'm not sure. I think they would have driven me back out to the edge of the site and said, see ya, okay? <laughs> because that would be a very hard thing to accept. Okay, but the key, it's, it's a combination of the two, which is you need to take those capabilities and say, where can I go with other adjacencies? So for example, that's 
very much what Fuji did. Uh, flat panel displays like everybody uses on your phones uh, or your TVs or your monitors use a material called cellulose triacetate for making po polarizer films. That is, in fact, the same material that is used uh, for photographic film. At the time, Kodak was too busy making money with consumer film. Fuji needed to build scale, so they said, oh, okay, we'll make some of this display film stuff. Okay, and uh, Fuji actually went and, you know, went into other businesses like cosmetics, which leverage the chemistry capability. Uh, you know, so the hard thing would have been to say, take this great consumer franchise and recognize I only have a finite lifetime with it. I'm going to milk it for what I can. I'll, I'll milk the film for what I can. I'll milk the digital for what I can, but realize I'm going to get commoditized. What if you'd, uh, what if you'd arrived in 1990? I mean, having now <coughs> studied this, were there things that management might have done differently what, earlier? What's, what's interesting about around the period around 1990, because uh, I've gone back and researched some of this. I've also gone and talked to a lot of competitors. I've talked to companies like Sony and Panasonic and people like that. Uh, and, you know, one of the, the things Kodak did, they, they really saw this digital thing coming. If anything, they might have invested a little too much in digital too early, right? So they came out with a product in 1990 uh, called Photo CD. Uh, 18, mega, 18 megabyte files, which, remember, 1990, we were still running 386 PCs, right? Your hard drive would have been 100 megabytes, right? And there were no way, uh, there were no good ways of moving 18 megabyte files around, okay? Uh, so if anything, and, and the reason they did that is because they wanted to produce a digital product that was as good as, as film, so it was scanned film, 18 megabyte file, right? Uh, I remember going to a Kodak management meeting early on doing a post-mortem of some of the early digital products that didn't really get traction. It's like uh, invest too much too early, then give up when it doesn't get market success, uh, and then s let somebody else capitalize on it. Okay, so, you know, I, I think the lesson there would be, well, you have to keep trying things, and then uh, as it plays out in the market, you have to constantly be evolving your strategy and not being afraid to give up some of those things. But it was clear that they saw digital as a threat, even in the mid-1980s. Um, you mentioned Steve Jobs earlier, um, and, and this reminds me of something that uh, Richard Rummel, the great strategy professor from UCLA, said in an interview we did with him for the McKinsey Quarterly a few years ago. Um, he said, in 1998, I had the chance to talk with Steve Jobs after he'd come back and turned Apple around. I couldn't help asking a question. Steve, I said, this turnaround at Apple has been impressive, but everything we know about the personal computer business says that Apple will always have a small niche position. The network externalities in personal computers are just too strong to de upset the de facto Wintel standard. So what are you trying to do? What is your longer term strategy? He didn't agree or disagree with my assessment of the market. He just smiled and said, I'm going to wait for the next big thing. Um, do you think that's good advice for a company in a code si situation like Codex? And, and if yes, what do you do while you wait? Uh, and, and how long can you wait? So let, let's dig on that quote a little bit more. Okay, because during that time, you know, I, I got to know Steve uh, in uh, the early 90s, and I used to go talk to him periodically as well, okay? And I think Richard's observation is still correct from the standpoint of the personal computer business, right? Because Apple still has uh, a minority market share in the PC business, but they did a couple of things, uh, and, and I remember talking to Steve about some of these, okay? They did some things that were really Steve and very prescient, okay? Uh, one of them was, Steve was unusually good at recognizing turning points in technology, okay? And one of them was, uh, he saw that disk drives and displays and processing power were going 
improving at a rate such that notebook computers would replace desktops, right? So I remember talking to him in about, I think it was around 1998, where they, just after he came back, and he said they're putting all their investments in notebooks and minor investment in desktops. I remember talking to Michael Dell around the same time, okay, and he was kind of not on that score, and, and they were absolutely right on that, okay? A couple other things they did uh, with the iPod, right? What, what was, Apple was not the first with the iPod. Uh, what, uh, what they recognized was when you could get a five gigabyte uh, or 10 gigabyte disk drive, uh, there was a transition point where uh, you could carry all of your recorded music with you, right? The first MP3 players, you know, maybe you could load 10 or 20 songs, okay? But he recognized, wait a minute, there's a transition point, and I could actually carry all my music with me. And then he did a smart thing, which is he bought the entire world's supply from Toshiba and Hitachi of those small disk drives, okay? So nobody else could make them, right? And he did the same thing with flash memory right, when he saw that transition coming. So I think what we can learn from Steve Jobs was looking at the trends, and it's very hard when you look at things like Moore's Law or you look at you know, the density curves on flash memory or the density curves on disk drives. The numbers are so big, it's hard to comprehend that. Kodak, people have the same problem. It's like, wow, you know, film will always be better, but you know, if you just looked at the CMOS curves, you could see that was gonna get better, right? And so, you know, I would rephrase that question as, can you see the next big thing? It, it actually takes great vision to understand the technology, understand the trends, and, and uh, see that the market is gonna, be, is gonna change. Then what you have to do is you have to go play in there, and, and you have to try things, and not, not everything that Apple did has been successful. I, can, I have a couple of their products that were less than successful. Steve would never talk about those, right? <laughs> You know, but, but you know, you try things and you refine them and you just keep putting it. So in waiting market. for the next big thing only works if well, you recognize the next big thing when it's, when it's in its I, I, I infancy. I think you need to be out there experimenting because if you don't, it makes it that much harder for you to recognize it. Okay, now, I would argue that what led to the next big thing, which was the iPhone, was really adding always-on connectivity to an iPod, right? Because if you look carefully at the evolution of the iPod from you know, the uh, original design to the iPod Touch with the touch screen, you know, uh, that was actually the logical next step, and they benefited from doing all that experimentation. There was a lot of experimentation uh, that went on in the iPod, right? Uh, they gave me one of their, the first iPods and it only worked with a Mac. Oh yeah, maybe we should connect it to Windows. It's like, uh, oh yeah, maybe we have to deal with this song problem. So they worked out a lot of stuff when they, uh, you know, th which later helped them in terms of the iTunes store, okay, which helped them in terms of the app model and the distribution model. So there is, I would argue there was actually a lot of learning along that way. So let's, let's keep shifting gears to technology companies of today. You, you've painted a picture of Kodak as a company that had some structural strengths that became weaknesses. And I wonder if, as you look at today's tech landscape, uh, what companies you think could be most threatened by structural shifts of the right. same kind. Right, so what I said about Kodak was kind of this digital plus modular in losing the scale benefits, right? And so I went and talked to a lot of the Japanese companies like Sony and Panasonic. I would argue, for example, Sony had the exact same problem. So now if I, uh, th that's what happened to their TV, TV business. They lost the scale advantage and they lost with the modularity and therefore commoditization. Okay, the things I would worry about, uh, I'll, I'll just throw out a couple, you know. I'm not real keen on the enterprise server business these days. Okay, because if you see where the scale benefits are shifting to, uh, they're shifting to the hyperscale players and not the OEMs, 
who actually gave up a lot of their scale business to the Asian ODMs who designed the product for them. Okay, so I see great turmoil ahead there. Okay, more generally, earlier today we heard about the role of software, right? I, I think one of the other uh, big trends out there is the, uh, the migration of functionality from hardware into software. I can give you some fun examples. There might be stupid examples, okay, but when, when you see stuff like that, you say, okay, here's the same type of commoditization problem that's coming, software-defined networking, right? I mean, Cisco is on it, but, you know, what we're going to is a world of commodity hardware platforms with software differentiation where all of a sudden the entry barriers are even lower than they already were. Right. And uh, so I think it's, I think it becomes tough, becomes tougher. And I think there are other areas there too. And, and who, who, given that, are, are there some tech leaders, maybe software based ones that you would say are more insulated from these kinds of structural shifts that you see with Kodak? Well, I think to the extent that you can build, and we heard about, you know, kind of network effects and, you know, those kind of aggregation effects earlier. I think to the extent that you can build a following based on some of your software platform aspects uh, that insulates you some just as it has helped Apple uh, with, you know, the App Store and their whole ecosystem. Uh, although I, I, I do see risks for them as well in the future. Okay. Are there questions or should I, I've got millions more. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there are problems with most large organizations. I also spent 14 years at IBM. One of the jobs I had at IBM is I was assistant to the chairman before Lou Gerstner. Okay, and uh, Lou Gerstner actually described what I would say was a common problem for large organizations, including Kodak. Okay, and that, was, that problem was, and he states it very well. He came to HBS once a couple years ago and he uh, talked to a group of people about it. And he said, you know, IBM had a very powerful culture, right? That culture was uh, built based on organizational processes and ways of working, which were, which made the company enormously successful in the 60s and 70s and even into the 1980s, okay? Uh, uh, and, and that organizational culture was really, uh, it was a sales-driven culture, among other things, and it had to do with how the company managed priorities and distributed responsibilities. And, uh, and, and he said, in that, in that crisis that IBM faced, uh, he said, it, and I saw this because, as I said, I worked for the chairman before Lou, which nobody remembers as John Akers. He said it was not because management didn't have strategies about how to address the problem. It was not because they didn't try to institute changes that they uh, needed, you know, and Lou said it very well. He said, why wasn't it that, uh, why wasn't it until I was age 55 that I understood organiza organizational culture was the most important thing? I would say the same thing. Why wasn't it until I was age 55 until I really understood the age of, the role of organizational culture? Gerstner's point, and I think it applied to IBM and it applied to Kodak, was the culture was so strong that in many respects you couldn't make those changes until you faced a crisis. A lot of economists will ask that question about why is it in changing markets uh, organizations can't evolve their culture continuously. That's what you'd like to see as opposed to what they would describe as a punctuated equilibrium, which is everything's going fine and then I have a crisis and then I'm going to make a big change and then everything will go fine for a while until I get to the next crisis. By the way, IBM's going through that now again, and then I'm going to change. Uh, and it's because of this uh, stickiness of culture. I want, I want uh, people to change their ways of working 
which for so many years made them successful, okay, and allowed them to be promoted. That's not easy. It's not easy for any organization that I've ever seen. So, Willie, I want to come back to your, the solution you described for Kodak, which was sort of to think about this as two different mm -hmm. businesses and, and milk the old business and then adapt the capabilities of the rest to do things. Um, you said you would have gotten run out of town, perhaps, if you suggested that, but... Um, well, a actually, it was, you know... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I probably would have gotten <laughs> I mean, I, so let's, I just would love to explore the feasibility. To, first of all, um, would you, how do you do it? Would you do it structurally? Would you, I mean, is this the kind of the new co, old co people talk about? What, what's uh, the, well, yes. I mean, what uh, actually everybody change. always prescribes is you do a separate organization. Yeah. Okay, and a uh, separate organization uh, developed its own ways of working, its own processes, its own ways of measuring all these things. That was, in fact, what we did, right? When I got there, uh, they gave me 2,800 people, and it's like, go, go do this separately, right? Mm -hmm. So we were an independent organization, and uh, anybody in the, existing, in the existing film business who had a problem, by the way, the president of the consumer film business lived across the street from me. Right, and he often had problems with me. <laughs> <laughs> and he often wanted to meet, and he would often invite me to meet, the implication being when he'd come across the street and talk to me. And I would always meet him in the CEO's office downtown. Right, so whenever he wanted to meet, we'd meet in the CEO. And the CEO hosted a meeting every Friday morning for anybody who had any problems with these new upstarts. Okay. That worked pretty well, right? We built our own worldwide distribution system. We built our own sales force. We built our own product development. You know, we shared some aspects of manufacturing. But there were problems with that, which I didn't really appreciate and discover until the end. Uh, well, not until the end, but the last couple of years I were there, which was, okay, so now I have these guys in the historic business who I need to deliver cash flow and I need to deliver earnings. And your career path is when that business winds down, thank you very much, we'll see you. That's a hard pill to swallow. Okay, now, did I take people from those businesses? Yeah, whenever I could. Do they have the right skills? More often than not. Okay, uh, I think that that was the most difficult challenge I faced, okay? And eventually, that led to my undoing because uh, the pressure on that became so high that management decided to merge the businesses, and that was the end of it. Interesting. We just have a couple minutes left. Are there, are there further questions for Willie? From uh, Gideon, Corey, Triance, could you speak about Kodak brand and, and how how it was diminished, and what is it worth today? I mean, the reason we're talking about Kodak because it's a Kodak moment, and it's an amazing brand name. Yeah, uh, it was an amazing brand, uh, and it served the company very well for uh, 100 years. Okay, but the, the problem is it was also intimately associated with, it, it was perhaps too closely associated with the technology. Uh, uh, I don't have a good answer on that uh, because uh, in some sense, I mean, I, I look at digital imaging, okay, and I, I had a friend who went over to GoPro. It's like, look at GoPro, right? I mean, they, they started out of nowhere, developed a very powerful brand around a particular use case and segment, okay? Uh, sometimes you have to let go, okay? and. Uh, in retrospect, I would say, uh, uh, I explain this to more technical audiences as, you know, when the universe cools to four degrees Kelvin, all gross margins are zero. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, what that says is you have some amount of time, uh, and then you know, innovations are really about creating hot spots, right? And it's like, I'm gonna keep it warm as long as possible, all right? But, you know, uh, I, I guess the new news for me is all these things have a lifetime, right? And Kodak brand has subsequently been licensed out for a lot of other things. I, I think making the transition to digital, perhaps we 
overvalued that uh, as opposed to, well, you know, I mean, we, we did other things. I never, I never assumed it was as much an asset as other people did. So, uh, but I think the strength of the brand and the value of the brand, in hindsight, may have made things more difficult. Great. Well, I think we're out of time. I mean, absolute zero may not be the most uplifting note to uh, <laughs> to end on. But you know, I said four <laughs> degrees. <at> four degrees. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I, we don't have to end. You, you don't have to end. I would encourage everyone to read Willie's uh, great Sloan Management Review article, the real uh, what is it, the real uh, story of Codex to Real lessons. The real lessons of Codex Decline. Yeah, great, great article and uh, great lessons today. Thank you, Willie. Really appreciate it. Thanks for that one.